I'm a church musician. Uh, sometimes I change the words of hymns to, uh, to decolonise them or to make them more relevant. Um, and I was at a musical, new musical called And Juliet, where the context of the song was changed by, say, the gender of the person singing. Um, Billy, you, you, you changed uh, words to the lyrics. You're, you're brave in that regard. Why do you do it? And should we do more of it? Well, I think you, you do need to, um, if you're going to write songs um, that are, uh, you know, reflecting uh, the way the world is and, and times change, you do need to update words sometimes. I mean, some words can stand alone. I mean, Woody Guthrie wrote This Land Is Your Land 80 years ago now, mm. and that still resonates with a lot of people. But, um, you know, for instance, I wrote a song, um, a song called Sexuality uh, in the 1990s, a song of allyship with the gay and lesbian community. And a couple of years ago, I was in Boston and do, doing a bit of signing after the show, and a woman said to me, you know that song, Bill, where you go for a beer with that gay guy? It's not very radical anymore, is it, mate? <laughs> and she was right. We've, we've come a long way, you know. We've come an incredible way with that. And she pointed out rightly to me that the, the real front line now is with the trans community. So I've slightly tweaked the lyrics of the song to make it a song of allyship to the, to the trans and non-binary community. And I think you need to do that. I think it's rather... It's be like, you know, if you're an activist, you, you know, you're out in the 1980s with the minors. Is that it? Or do you still engage in the way that you did then? Because, you, you know, we, we can never remain pretty uh, and we can never remain hip either, trust me. I've tried that as well. But <laughs> there's no reason why we shouldn't remain relevant. So in order to make the songs relevant, whether you're changing the lyric or changing the gender or, or just doing Shakespeare in modern clothes, just to make it relevant to connect with the audience that you're talking to, I think that's the way I work. <laughs> Th thanks for the question, mate. And, and I would say to Billy that I, I think it's a pretty important thing that you actually did change those lyrics in solidarity with the trans community. You know, in, in Australia, Stan, one in two trans kids have make some attempt on their life as a, as a child. And, like, these kids have a challenging enough world as it already is without some of the culture wars that we see day to day, not just in Australia, but around the world to some of these kids. And, you know, where my grandmother left, they made the Jewish community wear a yellow star mm. and they made the LGBTIQ community wear a pink, star, a pink triangle. And if you come for one, you come for all. And I think the solidarity that you showed, Billy, is really important and that we should be uh, giving people a bit of respect, a bit of dignity and a bit of acceptance because everyone deserves to be a part of a community and everyone deserves to have Billy Bragg songs written about them as well. And, and <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I want to bring Gigi in in just a minute. But, Josh, can I also talk about language? And even tonight, and I know Antoinette didn't mean it in, in an offensive way, but references to neo-Nazis, Gary Lineker talking about the 1930s, and as a Jewish person, language has power, and when you hear things like that, um, how does it make you feel? Uh, my honest answer is I, I'm not sure it progresses the argument that much and, and in fact, it has to be a pretty, a pretty uh, important historical comparison in order to use it would be my, my sort of disposition. If it's done in a respectful way, it's obviously better than others uh, and, you know, I don't think for one second Antoinette meant it in a disrespectful way. Um, so I, I, but, it's, but it's just language yeah. and, and how language is used and how language becomes popularised and, and being aware of language is, is probably the critical point, isn't it? And, Gigi, you're actually not in favour, though, are you, of changing things retrospectively? Well, I think that Billy should be free to change the lyrics of his songs. Absolutely, they're his songs. And, and if it makes him feel better or it makes him think he's going to sell more songs or be more relatable, then that's fine. But what I really object to is changing our own artists who have already given their stories, like changing Dahl. those stories, like Roald Dahl, for example, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because you are taking away his voice. That is censorship. Secondly, you are essentially stripping future art, art historians of the opportunity to study the progression of art through the ages. You're, you're changing what we have had. And, and when in the history of man has, has artistic censorship led to something we can all get behind, like, like more liberty, more freedom, more equality? Do, do, Generally speaking, artistic censorship is associated with politics. Now, and art is not a place to do politics at its best. Art reflects the society that it is but, created but, in. But things are... I mean, you, you mentioned before um, changing uh, church songs or hymns. Yeah, I mean, the Bible's been <laughs> rewritten many, many sure. times. Things are, things are changed, aren't yeah, they, do, do you think, like, changing the word fat and crazy is artistic censorship? Yes, I do. If those were Roald Dahl's words, yes. 
<laughs> but unfortunately, and, 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 and can I just say, if you don't like those words, if you don't like Roald Dahl's story, write your own story. Yeah, I just don't like the idea of if we're. I'm sorry, but if we're not, if it's if it's not acceptable to call someone fat in 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 society, and I don't think it is personally, yeah. why should we be telling our children it's okay? Well, well you don't and, have to and buy the Dahl, book. And Dahl particularly used fat as a characterisation of someone to say that they were lazy yeah. and uh, and uh, sure, a, a characterisation. That's not the way this. to do it. Do you really do you really think that do you have the conceit to believe that your morality today is the ultimate and perfect morality for all time? Mm. No. I mean, when no, people just... write things, when they write them, thousands of years yeah. ago hundreds of years ago or in the future. No. They have a particular view of their society yeah. and they are reflecting their fine. society in their art. Yeah. You can tell a different story now. That's fine. That's great. That's progress. But to silence those who have come before us? Freedom of speech no. gives you the right to express... <laughs> freedom, freedom of speech gives you the right to express your opinion. It doesn't give you the right to be abusive, I'm afraid. And I think there has to be a limit. There has to be a limit. And what we can say, sure, we can offend, of course we can offend, but I think that sort of abusive language has no place in children's books whatsoever. But I think personally. what we're doing by... Uh, and I agree with Gigi on this. I think it's great for you to change your own works and uh, I think that's, that's good. And with permission, cos I know... Bobby McGee has been variously mm. a male and a female character in a fantastic Fine song it is, song. too. <laughs> but, um... Changing form art or someone else's words to bring it up to today's moral standards actually takes away our opportunity to have a conversation mm -hmm. and to say, well, that was... But isn't you know, that, isn't that part of the conversation? Is, is the Sh Sh Shakespeare is reinterpreted, rewritten. Yeah. I mean, isn't that part of the conversation? But, but, but by then... But children, it is I have a conversation. Children, I have young children who re re read Roald Dahl. By then, mm. uh, in the schoolyard, they're calling people fat and crazy. Those biases are already entrenched. And so it's awkward when you're trying to teach your children, hey, don't call that person fat and crazy, and then they're... Every, every second child has read a Roald Dahl book and really it's a commercial reality. The estate stipulates that they can be changed to sell books. They want to sell books. They need to be relevant. Um, and so the decision was made to, to take out some of that language. It doesn't change the storyline. It just means that we're not, we're not demonising a certain person based on appearance. We're not equating fat yeah. with lazy and useless. Well, to, be, to be honest, honestly, a lot of the language that we have been using today, you know, is, is dividing people. You are dividing people by skin colour. People are being divided by whether they're fat or thin. People are so divided I, by this that. No, let me finish. I'm well, this mean, kind I of language is not I'm helpful. Divide. Let me finish, please. I, I just want to May I please walk. finish? Go ahead. This kind of language is not helpful because it draws us away from each other when all of the problems we have today, from children in the playground who aren't being tolerant to each other to politicians making decisions that are not in line with what is good for people at the lower end of the income scale, these problems are things we need everybody to come to the table and solve together as human beings. Not as people who are white or black or men or women oh, or old I mean, or I young. Think, you, we need everybody to, and we need a diversity of opinion. And by the way, if you agree with me, please visit sciencefreedom.org, Australians for Science and Freedom. We need to be able to talk about inequality, inequality that, things. that inequality that impacts people based on gender, on, on sexuality, on ability, on race. Like, it's, it's really lovely and kumbaya to be like, oh, we can't talk about this because we're dividing. People are divided. Their, their life chances and opportunities are limited. But then by re-editing books and taking away things and saying, oh, no, we don't want that in there because that might offend someone, instead of actually saying, you know, sitting down, my kids read Roald Dahl and... Unfortunately, I couldn't get them across to the end of Blight and Famous Five because they were my favourites. But, you know, and sitting there going, no, no, we don't call people fat. We don't call people idiots because that's not the appropriate way to talk no, to I... people. And even when Roald Dahl wrote them, you're right, he wrote them to be offensive about the characters. Mm -hmm. And it opens mm -hmm. the conversation. We'll, we'll just call, put a pause there on it because it's a conversation we've had before and I'm sure we'll have it again. But could I just get a quick show of hands? There's been a lot of, lot of cheering for, for all sides here. Hands up if you think it's OK to change books that have been written in the past for today's audience. Hands up. And hands up if you think it's not OK. OK, there you go. There's a straw poll for us. I mean, the point, the point that, about what you were saying there, Gigi, is that the arc of history is long, but it, it bends towards inclusivity. You know, that's the way history moves, OK? And, unfortunately, there are still people who have been 
excluded. I completely so, agree. OK, with so it. we can't just sit down and say everybody can come to the table when they can't physically yeah. come to the table. So, so you I need a process agree. of inclusion in order to bring people in. Okay. And can I, just say, can I just say that inclusion begins with acknowledgement. Mm. That's yeah. the very beginning. Sorry, when you yeah, acknowledge you there's a problem, without acknowledgement, yeah. you have no change whatsoever.